fellow conspiracy realist, we proudly present to you a classic episode that is bound to make waves because Matt, whenever we talk about this, we get a lot of correspondence. Yeah. As 5G was rolling out, people were nervous that it was doing other stuff, that it was causing some serious problems. If you go on certain social networks right now, you can see videos that people are taking of what appear to be weather patterns happening, but at least according to the people making the videos, these are 5G networks being turned on and off and on again and manipulating with radiation and humanity. But that's not where these rumors started. They started way back uh, as 5G was rolling out. From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined with our super producer, Paul, Mission Control, Deck, and most importantly, you are you. You are here, and that makes this stuff they don't want you to know, whether you are listening on a laptop, a tablet, or your phone, which is overwhelmingly likely, right? Hopefully you're not listening to your phone through the, the earpiece that's designed to listen when you're talking as like a, an actual phone, uh-huh. because that would be silly to listen to a podcast that way. Don't do that. What do you mean? Which one? You mean like the little... Like as like if you're Bluetooth? taking a call, yeah. holding it up to your ear? Ah, yes. Yeah, don't listen to podcasts Surely there's somebody, probably in Williamsburg, who is listening to this on a landline rotary phone, just for the look. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, like the audio signal is just uh, interpreted as a series of clicks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I listen to all my podcasts after I burn them to vinyl. Like I, I cut them to vinyl and then I listen. I'm a cassette guy. Yeah, nowadays. <laughs> just, I, this is this is weird though because we are talking about how quickly technology evolves today, and we're also talking about uh, the unintended ripple effects of of technology and it's strange because not only are we seeing continual breakthroughs in uh, multiple areas of technical innovation we're also seeing the frequency of those breakthroughs uh, increase you know what i mean like if you if you look across the span of human civilization uh, it, maybe it took us several thousand years to figure out something we would consider very basic today and now it seems that uh, all you have to do is not check the news for about a week and when you uh, check back in. You will find something new, amazing, and horrifying. Yeah, it's a brave new world every time. Every single time. I, I have a personal question that I thought would be a, a good way to kick off today's episode. This is uh, for you guys. This is also for you listening out there in internet land, fellow conspiracy realists. The question is this. When did you get your first cell phone? Also, side question. I think we talked about this on a previous episode. Who had a beeper? I had a beeper. I had a beeper. I remember the codes. I had one of those nice little clear green Motorola's. Yeah, I didn't sell drugs, guys, so I never had one. Matt, Matt, <laughs> the judgment. No, it was just no. For, for keeping up with pals. I'm, I'm totally joking. I just never had one. Uh, I, I wished that I had one. I had friends that had beepers, but uh, – I guess nowadays that's what they're used for, if they're used. Uh, doctors, actually, they're tremendously popular in the medical field. With like getting a 911, like you need to be here a certain place at a if certain time. If you can't hear an intercom system and you get a, uh, you get a beep. Yeah, beep, beep, beep. buzzes you. Um, I think I must have come in right on the tail end of, uh, of beeperdom because mm-hmm. I don't remember having one for much longer than a school year. And uh, then I was right into cell phone land. That you know that totally checks out. Like mm-hmm. the point where they became affordable for you know every everyday people like us mm-hmm. to the point where uh, cellular technology like jumped up. I think that's probably about right. I remember friends with doctor parents having car phones that came in those bags. Mm-hmm. You know that would you'd hold you'd store it like in the little uh, where the emergency brake would be between the seats of their Lexus <laughs> oh, console, wow. mm-hmm. and it would have maybe a half hour of juice. Maybe. Yes. Uh, this uh, The first cell phone I had, I think, was probably a Nokia. And it, that means that it probably still works. A little Nokia. 
Mm-hmm. Probably a little Nokia and then a flip phone, which I thought was so cool. I had a Razor. Yeah, I had Whoa. one of those at one time. Um, but it's strange because we've talked about this often on this show, uh, the – alarming the alarming speed at which the oddest things become normal not just here in the u.s but in any human society and nowadays if you're like most people this is the craziest thing across the world it's most people if you are like most people your mobile device has become an essential companion it's become your other brain and we have to face it for a lot of folks if you want to If we want to put it in a crass way for a lot of folks, going to the restroom without your phone is the new version of going off the grid. You know what I mean? Definitely. The days of Uncle John's bathroom reader are uh, are in decline because now you can learn almost anything nigh instantaneously. I was recently without a phone for about three days' time, and I, I felt like just completely unconnected from society. And yeah. it was it was it was both uh, kind of liberating and terrifying, dude. I uh, didn't look at my phone for about 10 minutes while I was at a uh, restaurant establishment with my family Mm -hmm. and I missed like I missed a bunch of communication that ended up being very important. Uh, and because I didn't look at my phone for like 10 minutes. It's, it's strange too. You know, the thing is the, the convert, the phoneless conversations are proven to be more substantive and studies show that when people have conversations without the phones around, uh, everyone involved tends to, in retrospect, feel that it was a good conversation or a better conversation. And I am saying that more substantive is a tricky word. Because that doesn't mean it was necessarily pleasant. You know what I mean? It could have been a breakup conversation. It could have been a fight with your fourth cousin or something. But regardless, we do notice the times that we do not have these mobile devices. They stand out to be phoneless. I I also, in 2018, I think I I didn't have a phone for a few days. And I was way more productive, to be honest. Uh, But... How did this become the new normal? How did the concept of mobile cell phone technology, uh, how did it propagate throughout global society? And what are the consequences? First, we have to start, as the Mad Hatter was wont to say, at the beginning with a brief history of cell phones. So here are the facts. During the First World War, The German military did test wireless phones on military trains running between Berlin and Zosen. And then later, in 1924, wireless phones were tested on trains running between Berlin and Hamburg. And these, when you say wireless phones, of course, these are not like a Samsung Galaxy or an iPhone. And even before the First World War, there was an inventor who claimed that he had discovered this technology, but he was thought to be a full-on crackpot. Would these have maybe looked like those crazy backpack phones you see in uh, in some war films? Not nearly as advanced at that point. Yeah, well, but they would still be quite bulky and probably yes. – uh, Yeah, it yeah, needed huge antennas, right? And then during the Second World War, we've talked about this before, wars drive innovation. Military forces around the globe started making use of radio telephony links and starting in – Around 1940, handheld radio receivers were widely available. They were not inexpensive by any means, but it allowed military forces to communicate from battlefields to other locations. Huge advantage if you had use of that technology. Game changer. And all of these technologies eventually inspired researchers at Bell Labs to create a mobile phone system for vehicles. This allowed people to place and receive calls inside their automobiles. We can only imagine how accidents may have spiked at the time. Right? <laughs> what set these apart from just like walkie-talkie or radio communication? It's, a, it's an excellent question and yes, yes, that's foreshadowing. We'll get to there in just a second because – At the time, people who really needed these mobile communications abilities installed these radio telephones in their cars and they were different from walkie-talkies. First off, in that they had a better range. Walkie-talkies have a relatively limited range, uh, but they also had a lot of constraints. So there was one central antenna tower in every city and that city had maybe 25 channels available, meaning 25 places where you could talk. 
on the radio, right, wirelessly. Because there was only one antenna, this meant that if you had a phone in your car, you also needed a powerful transmitter, large enough to transmit 40 to 50 miles away, you know, because otherwise, just get a walkie-talkie, right? It also meant that not many people could use these telephones concurrently. There just weren't enough channels. So it's like a bandwidth issue. Yeah, person number 26 is SOL, you know, which means straight out of luck on a family show. That's interesting because that is obviously the way this technology progresses to be much more useful to a larger amount of people is with this idea of bandwidth. Yeah, exactly. Eventually, AT&T and Bell Labs would introduce what we know as cellular technology. Instead of one big central antenna, we'll have multiple antennas divided into a cellular grid, and this will allow us to reuse frequencies multiple times in areas covered by low-power transmitters. This meant that mobile phones, for the first time in history, could be more than a pipe dream. If you believe the official story, there are other people who tell you that this technology was actively suppressed by the U.S. government. But at this time, they became an economically feasible product. And uh, the second nation to develop this technology officially was the good old USSR. Did they get it from uh, acts of espionage or did they just go buy a phone and figure it out? That's not the subject of today's episode. Uh, we, we'd like to hear from you. But let's go back to the question you presented, Noel, which is uh, tremendously important. Why is a cell phone better than a walkie-talkie or why is it better than, say, a CB radio, a citizen band radio? In the most basic form, a cell phone is just that. It's a two-way radio, got a transmitter, got a receiver. So Matt calls super producer Paul Mission Control Deccant on his cell phone and his phone converts his voice to an electronic signal. It's then transmitted via radio waves to the nearest cell tower. This network of cell towers goes ping, 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 relays the radio wave to Paul's cell phone, and that converts it to an electrical signal and then back to sound again. So at its basic form, it works just like a walkie-talkie. But the genius of the cell system is that it, again, divides a city or an area into smaller cells that are often mapped hexagonally. This allows us to reuse all these frequencies. So if, for instance, I call Noel, then we can still have a conversation despite the fact that Matt and Paul are also using cell phones to speak with each other. Uh, a good way to understand it is to compare it to a CB radio walkie-talkie. It goes – without getting too far in the weeds, it goes into something called full duplex versus half duplex. Walkie-talkies, CB radios are half duplex devices and that means two people are communicating on the same frequency so only one person can talk at a time. Uh, you know, the bears are up ahead, over. So that I know that I can talk and then say over. We got to say copy first. Copy. Copy. Over. <laughs> my, my favorite, still, my favorite introduction to CB lingo is in an excellent song by J.W. McCall called Convoy. Can excellent you, is a strong word here. Can you give us a little taste? Uh as dark a moon on the 5th of June with a Kenworth hauling hogs, Cav over Pete with a reefer on and a Jimmy something, something. Yeah. Dude, I want to hear that whole song. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting because it's interspersed with conversation. It's interspersed with conversations ostensibly occurring over a CB band. Nice. This, do you know, do you not know about Convoy? No. I Dude, we've been friends for over a decade. Are you serious? I don't know. I don't know about Convoy. You're lying, right? No. You're, is this something that's been very important to you for a long time? Yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> I just know I feel like I have been a bad friend to you, Matt, or an excellent friend by not sending this to you. Anytime a song starts with that, that cadence of... Yeah. I'm down. I want to hear that song. It's, uh, <laughs> it's essentially... <laughs> It's essentially country rap. I will send it to you. Um, but but it does contain that kind of over uh, – that, that nomenclature because people couldn't just talk back and forth the way that we're able to talk on our phones today, even if we're talking at the same time. 
So a cell phone, in contrast, is a full duplex device. So we're using one frequency for talking and a second separate frequency for listening. We can talk at once. It's a gift and a curse if you've ever been on a group chat, right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, let's, let's look at these channels. So a walkie-talkie typically has one channel. A CB radio has 40. A typical cell phone can communicate on over 1,000 channels. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot. So let's also talk about range because this is very, very important. We've kind of gone, gone over this a little bit more uh, or just already as we're going through. But a walkie-talkie can only go about a mile. Uh, that's not so great. And that's using a, a 0.25 watt transmitter, so a quarter watt transmitter. Uh, but then a CB radio, on the other hand, because it has a lot uh, higher power out, output, essentially, you're, you're putting a lot more power into it. You can transmit about five miles. Hey, there you go. Five times a walkie talkie. I'll take that. Yeah. And that's uh, jumping up to a five watt transmitter. But since cell phones operate within these cells for these various areas, they can switch cells as they move around. Um, the system gives mobile phones an absolutely incredible, comparatively incredible range. Um, Someone using a cell phone could drive hundreds of miles and maintain a conversation the entire time, even as it's getting passed around to these different cell networks. So in a typical analog cell phone system in the U.S., the cell phone carrier receives about 800 frequencies to use across an area or a city, for example. Um, the carrier chops up the city into these different cells, and each cell is sized about 10 square miles. That's really – not very large. I always think of the cells as being larger than that, but 10 square miles isn't that huge. Um, right. And then 800 frequencies within that. But it makes you <clears throat> it makes you realize why if you ever go to a big concert or a huge festival or something, why the cell phone towers get overwhelmed very quickly. Yeah, man. Nothing worse than being in an overloaded cell area when you just feel – completely unable to escape. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know I, mean? I know. Because usually it's a place where you feel like you need your phone. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, and how are people going to find out about all my awesome grams? you got to save them up for later and do a later <laughs> gram. <laughs> okay. So it's true. They can get overloaded. They're still better than a bunch of people running around with walkie-talkies or backpack-mounted CB radios. Cell phones do use radio waves to communicate. Radio waves just transport that voice or data in the form of oscillating electric magnetic fields. We call these the electromagnetic field, or EMF. The rate of oscillation, that's what we call frequency. Radio waves carry the information. They travel through the air. Cell phones don't have a specific, um, a specific point at which they transmit. They emanate these waves in all directions. They can be absorbed and reflected by surrounding objects before they reach the nearest cell tower. This means, for example, when the phone is placed next to your head, the same way that you alluded, Matt, to someone listening to this podcast and without headphones, when it's placed next to your head during a call, a significant portion of this emitted energy goes through your body. It's absorbed into your head and your body, over half of it in some cases. However, these radio waves – or what's called radio frequency radiation, or RFR. They are a form of what we understand to be the not harmful radiation. Radiation, but not harmful. Non-ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation is the stuff that can wreak havoc. We already know that stuff can wreak havoc, like a um, X-rays. You don't want to yeah. have X-rays every day for funsies because yeah. that will add up. You don't want to throw those extra electrons around. That's the, mm -hmm. the idea. Right. Cell phones contain at least one radio antenna meant to transmit or receive radio signals. And some cell phones use one antenna as a transmitter and receiver, while others, such as iPhones, have multiple transmitting or receiving antennas. So more, more points from which these waves originate, right, or emanate. And – I have to say that the image, when you really picture this with each cellular device that's out there, whether it is making a phone call or connected via LTE or 5G or 4G or whatever it is, all of us, if you could see it, if you could see the matrix, it's it would be a crazy thing. We're swimming in it. We are swimming in it. And you have to imagine how insane the average city must look. Uh, to any creature whose vision extends into 
the this sort of range, anyone that could perceive these waves, you know? Yeah, if <laughs> if you're flying by as an extraterrestrial that your sensors can see all that stuff and you just view it, you would just go, nope. <laughs> yeah, and well, and some people believe that they have the ability to sense these things, usually in a way that is painful or disruptive to their day-to-day -day life, sort of like um, uh, Saul Goodman's brother in Better Call Saul. I wish I could conjure his name, but his brother. Yeah, who, who feels that he has this sensitivity. But he is in the minority. People who wish to avoid cell phones are in the extreme minority of modern society. There's immense convenience, plummeting prices. This has ensured the stratospheric growth of this industry. And we have some numbers about it too that, you know what, sound like they are exaggerated, but I assure you they are not. Over 400 million cell phone subscribers just within the United States in 2017. And that's according to the Cellular Telecommunications and Internet Association, who also report that 95 percent of Americans use a cell phone. And globally, there are more than 5 billion cell phone users today. So that begs the question, with all of those phones out there shooting out waves, uh, is, is there danger here? Mm -hmm. That's more than half of the people currently alive. Well over half, yeah. yeah. Uh, for decades now – Many people from uh, from various various disciplines, including including learned academics and scientists, and including people who are more fringe researchers, have been warning that cell phones might be too good to be true. They may not be as fantastic as they're cracked up to be. I do want to take a second and say that cell phones have done magnificent things for humanity. You guys probably all remember – seeing someone complain about, for instance, a, a homeless person who has a cell phone and saying, well, things can't be that bad. Things are still really bad. It's just now that is a necessity to possess. You know, you're a veteran on the streets. Uh, you were carrying a bunch of documentation around in a backpack that you hoped wouldn't get stolen. But now if you have an internet connection, you can access all of that information, right? So these are an invaluable tool. But – they may be a tool with consequences. They may be a sword that swings both ways because critics will tell us that these devices are a genuine health risk. Could they be causing unintended medical complications? More directly, for the purposes of today's episode, could using a cell phone really give you cancer? We'll answer that question right after a quick word from our sponsor. <laughs> Here's where it gets crazy. Yes, sort of. If you happen to be a rat, it is conclusive that overusing a cell phone will give you cancer. Like a tiny rat-sized cell phone or? <laughs> uh, 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 an outdated sort of cell phone. A recent U.S. National Toxicology Program study uh, was released in November of 2018, and they found that exposure equivalent to what would be created from 1990s era cell phone technology, those being 2G and 3G, um, second generation, third generation kind of communication, is associated with brain tumors in male rats. And I have a typo here. It looks like I said male rates. <laughs> the rates of brain cancer in male rats does increase appear to increase with exposure to this th this type of energy. They found that high exposure to the RFR, the uh, radio frequency radiation we mentioned earlier, uh, was associated with several disturbing things. Uh, first, clear evidence of tumors in the hearts of male rats. These were malignant – once you get ready because this is a weird name – malignant schwannomas, which sounds like <laughs> way more fun than it is. It does sound like fun. Schwannoma. Schwing. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what it conjures in my head too. Oh gosh. Ugh. That's such a bad Wayne's World joke way to happen. They're so hot that if they were a cancer, they'd be Schwannoma. Schwannoma. Also so, makes me think of like a <laughs> like a like a, a rap, you know, a shawarma. Shwar yeah. Oh, yeah. delicious. W R A P. Um <laughs> so here we here we go. Tumors in the heart, that's not great. 
How about tumors in the brain? Yep, there were some of those too, but only some evidence of tumors in the brains of these rats. Yes, yes. There was also some evidence of tumors in the adrenal glands of these rats. The tumors were both benign and malignant. Here's here's how it worked to that question of whether they were using little rat phones, which would have been way more endearing. They were exposed to radiation with a frequency of 900 megahertz, which was typical of cell phones in use when they first came up with the methodology of this study in the 1990s. And they were exposed to this for about nine hours a day for two years. So that's always been on your phone, nine hours a day. The lowest levels of radiation used in this study were equivalent to the maximum exposure a phone of this type could cause and still receive regulatory approval from the feds. And the highest rates the animals were exposed to were four times beyond that. So it's kind of like those studies where they say uh, this type of ingredient in your food can give rats cancer. Yeah, like the the sweet and low or whatever, right? right? They give them like – 50 times their body weight in sweet and low or whatever, mm-hmm. and that gives them just a little bit of cancer. Just a little bit. So we, what does this actually mean? When we say that there's clear evidence, it's tempting for us to say all of those rats got cancer. No, it turns out that 2 or 3 percent of irradiated male rats developed malignant uh, gliomas compared to none of the rats in the unexposed control group. Right. So this uh, this means that there appears to be some correlation. There appears to be all, even more importantly some causation, but it is not an instant death warrant. You know yeah. what I mean? Uh, additionally, they found some other things. Why are we harping on male rats? Because that's where they found the largest results. But the studies did find lower body weights among newborn rats and their mothers – And this tendency to be underweight corresponded with exposure to high levels of RFR during pregnancy and during the nursing or lactation period. But luckily for anyone who is currently um, feeling bad and and nuzzling their pet rat, uh, luckily these rats seem to grow to a normal adult size. So whatever happened that affected their weight uh, when they were younger – seems to have faded away by the time they grew to an adult stage. Well, you know, there's also a video from The Verge that discussed this study. And uh, the gentleman who made the video mentions that the male rats that developed cancer actually lived a little bit longer than the control male rats? Yes. So what? (laughs) That's very odd, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how that works out. But, uh, uh, you know, again, that's according to this gentleman uh, reading the same uh, study that we're referencing right now. Oh, right. And here's another important aspect. So we said they were exposed to radio frequency radiation, right? Subcategory of EMF, electric and magnetic fields, invisible waves of force that surround every, every working electronic device of this nature. The important part of this study is that From the previously existing official stances, while the research was messy and at times contradictory, we're pretty sure that this non-ionizing radiation was supposed to be okay. You know, it's not like putting an X-ray machine to your head, right? It's not like locking yourself in a a Faraday cage kind of human-sized microwave situation. Yeah, and the whole point of that is you're just not absorbing any of that stuff. There's no physical change to your atoms or to the chemicals in your body when you're hit by non, or at least in theory, when you're hit by the non-ionizing radiation. Yet this study seems to, seems to indicate otherwise. Yeah. And, you know, I'm very conscious of this while, while we're recording this episode, a lot of us are listening to this on our phones. Yeah. Our phones are in this room with us too. The three of us, Paul, I don't like, Oh, man, I don't want to ruin anybody's day here. <laughs> he's he's on his phone right now. And he's like, yeah, look at me. Check it out. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you uh, listening don't have this phone in your lap because then you oh, probably man. won't get heart or brain cancer. Okay. If you know what I'm saying. Just nether region cancer? Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. Just just an infection in your Australia. Oh, uh, it's in my pocket. I'm getting bottom, I moved it. I'm yeah, getting bottom cancer. <laughs> okay. Uh, you keep your phone in your back, back pocket, pocket while you're sitting? Yeah, that is weird, huh? Yeah. Are you, you just 
just warms, Roll the dice, warms, huh? warms me in a certain way. I guess. Do you have it on vibrate? I do. <laughs> <laughs> so this this is strange, though, and this is this is legitimately, if not disturbing, it's something that demands more study because often. For for a long time, we've heard these reports, right? And often they are phrased in such a way that they would be alarmist or they would be debunking. Mm-hmm. You know what they would say, you know they would say, well, this, this is tinfoil hat, crock pottery. You know, this is entirely an effort to scare people or to maybe sell some sort of pseudo scientific device. Yeah, I mean, like get a special. EM shield for your cell phone, which will prevent the radiation from touching you, but your phone will still work somehow. Yeah. Yeah. We don't need any of the actual radiation. Just Uh, the radiation that makes the device work. Yeah. You'd have to come up with a cell phone that is ostensibly connected to like a like an umbrella Mm -hmm. that goes out and the umbrella is the thing – at the end of that umbrella is actually where – the signal's coming from, so you have to aim that at the cell tower. Are you shark tanking us right now? <laughs> yeah, I'm shark tanking you guys. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm uh, uh, I'm moderately in, but I want 51%. Oh. Isn't that what they always say? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll give you $7 billion for 28%, and I own all the rights. <laughs> Why do they always want 51%? It's, cause it's so they have a controlling interest, right? That's right, yeah. So they can kick the person out later, uh-huh. I would imagine. Sheesh. This... This, though, leads us through the realm of scientific uncertainty to an actual finding. And then, you know, it's, it's time for us to answer the question that we as humans ask ourselves every day. Is it time to panic? Are we doomed? Are we all doomed? Should we even bother finishing this episode? We- Don't call anybody, though, <laughs> to let them know we're doomed. <laughs> we'll decide after a word from our sponsor. Okay, so we're back. We decided to continue the episode. I'm on the edge of my seat. Are we doomed? Uh, eventually, yes. <laughs> well, that's a loaded answer, Matt. <laughs> as far as cell phones go, currently, um, we don't know yet. Yeah. So first, going back to our earlier conversation about uh, NutraSweet and uh, – what was that other one, No, uh, Sweet and Low. Sweet and Low, yeah. Those artificial sweeteners uh, and the experiments uh, involving rats don't necessarily translate to human beings just given the quantities involved. And this means that what translates to rats in one exposure experiment may not always translate on a one-on-one level with human beings. The nature of the study also leads us to several pretty problematic aspects of these types of studies, not just this one specifically. So we used to say there were no available longitudinal studies of this sort of thing. Over the span of human civilization, it's a newer technology, at least the way it's it's used now. And so we would want decades of measurement, right? We would want maybe even something intergenerational. Mm. Like how what, – what are the rates of a population that existed pre-cell phone? What are the rates of someone who existed during the advent of cell phones? And then what, what, what are the rates of, of cancer, health problems, or cognition or what have you uh, for the successive generation, you know, for yeah. your kids? Well, for my mind, the, the problem with this kind of study, if you're going to try to even attempt it now and, and start a longitudinal study, even if you try to do it. 10 years ago, all of the other radiation that's being absorbed by all of these people outside of the cell phone use and that radio um, radiation, <laughs> RFR. Yes. Be, think about the Wi-Fi. Think about uh, all the other versions that are out there of mm-hmm. it's just radio frequencies that are just hitting us all the time. And how could you possibly remove somebody from all of that to have a long enough study with a human being or a set of human beings for 10, 20, 30 years. Well, I like that point because that also leads us to ask whether or not it would be ethical to put someone in that in that uh, type of isolated environment. You know? Yeah, even if you're performing that on rats, like controlling that environment is tough, first of all, to mm-hmm. make sure. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm certain that extensive steps are taken to isolate the control group 
But are you isolating them from the Wi-Fi that's functioning within a lab or from, you know, mm-hmm. any of the, anything else? I hope so. Got to get to the national radio quiet zone. I <laughs> mean, right? Also, again, I know it's controversial. I completely understand and agree with the body of laws and ethical policies that we have regarding human experimentation. I believe it's important. Um, I also believe that people should be allowed to uh, consent to self-experimentation or consent to dangerous experiments. So are you saying that this essentially constitutes human experimentation? If there's something that we don't have definitive proof of the negative outcome, (laughs) then we are literally being subjected to human experimentation, whether by things like this or certain products that we maybe don't fully know the uh, end game of yet? I mean, hey, we are – we are doing a species-wide improv bit that's lasted for thousands of years. You just got to wonder, awesome. is there something in the terms of service, do you think, in uh, cell phone contracts that sort of absolves these uh, networks of any future responsibility? If there is research that comes out, this is actually, this has been giving you cancer all along. They must have be shielding themselves in some way from that kind of litigation, that kind of class action, right? Yeah, it's fascinating because for people who are convinced that cell so, that cell phones do cause various uh, health maladies. For people who believe that, the cell phone manufacturers are functioning on the level of big tobacco or something. You know what I mean? Knowingly covering up uh, the long-term consequences. It's, It's a good question. We know that terms of service, first off, most people never read them. And that's the way most manufacturers want it because there's there's a lot of stuff in the details. There's a lot of fine print there. I know that there are health warnings aplenty about how to properly use a cell phone or a device. You know, don't put this in the water. Don't use this in a way it was not intended to be used, you know. And how much of that is just CYA stuff on the part of their legal team? How much of that is uh, something they don't want you to know? It's interesting. It's interesting. But surely if there were a definitive study proving beyond the shadow of a doubt that there is a causation involved with cell phone usage and the rise of cancer, surely the federal agencies and multiple governments would force manufacturers to inform people of this, right? I mean, it would be, yeah. It's not like sugar. Yeah. It's not like sugar industry. But it's it not w- like tobacco. You're right. It's not like asbestos. It's not. It's maybe it's like how they all were for decades. Is, or is it? Is it worse? Is the dangerous point I'm making? Yeah. Is it? Is it worse? Because we. It would. It would be too late for all of us. All of us. It would be too late. No. Oh, now we go into the epigenetic argument too. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's done. We're done. <laughs> you know what's interesting though is um, the Federal Communications Commission actually set the standard for acceptable levels of exposure to radio frequencies um, from all kinds of telecom networks and different corporations that rely on this technology in the U.S. But that hasn't been updated since the 90s. Right. And as we know, we're talking about that uh, ep- exponential growth of technology and updating these broadband free- the networks, especially with things like 5G on the horizon. It's interesting that that has not been looked at. Um, and since we don't know, it's probably a good idea and it certainly wouldn't hurt just to maybe not sleep with your cell phone under your pillow. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Or maybe it's a good place to start. Yeah. Stop putting it in your mouth. Or in your back pocket. Okay. <laughs> oh, Dr. Buzz Rendezvous over here. Hey, and if you're really worried about radiation, mm-hmm. um, don't go outside. Ever. Remain indoors. Because that's not only are the regular radio waves from radios out there, but the sun is hitting you as mm-hmm. well with some serious radiation. Cosmic the radiation. Most dangerous well. kind probably. Oh, and gamma, gamma radiation mm-hmm. is out there. It's bombarding you at all times. Whenever I get stressed out, I like to remember that there could be a gamma ray burst at any second, <laughs> and it's game over for everyone. You just imagine that the next moment doesn't happen because gamma ray. Close call. <laughs> oh man, close uh, call. Woo. Good thing we had we had Paul edit <laughs> that uh, and take us back in time. Yeah, this this point about the. Exponential evolution of technology is important too because it means even if we construct solid longitudinal long-term studies, 
we have to take into account that the technology itself keeps improving, evolving, and changing, which means that we do not have a constant against which to test these hypotheses, right? We said that this 2G and 3G technology, the the type of RFR there, uh, that has an association with a rising cancer, certain types of cancer with male rats, right? We don't have anything about that for maybe 5G. We have some worried people. We have some ongoing studies. But if we were to conduct, as you said, Matt, a test with 5G over, say, 30 years, see what happens. Yeah. People won't still be using those phones in 30 years. That'll be archaic, you know? And we should also mention that Cancer has a um, – is, is subject to a lot of misconceptions in popular science. Saying, saying cancer is like saying fruit. You're describing a kind of thing, but there are thousands of that kind of thing. You know what I mean? And I'm sure that people would say an apple is not the same as – what's another fruit? Oh, an orange. Ah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I was going to suggest star fruit. That's way better. That's way better. Let's let's sub out oranges for some Perhaps fruit. a pomegranate. Is that a fruit? Surely it must be. I don't know. <laughs> Tomato? That's a fruit. Yeah. Technically it's true. And people thought it was a poisonous fruit. Ben, I think you're so right about the longitudinal study things in our technology. I was if I was trying to imagine twenty years ago. Twenty years ago, what was the cell phone back then? What do you guys think? Like right, right towards like 1998, 99, it was the Matrix phone is the one I think about that like popped down. Oh, it was yeah. It's still yeah. essentially oh, yeah. a flip phone. That's yeah, like yeah. 20 years ago. That was also – I mean the Razor wasn't that far removed from that. Yeah. Yeah. That was sort of looked at as sort of like the next gen flip phone because I think it had like color screen or something like that mm-hmm. or it could have – it could go on the internet in some very rudimentary way. Mm-hmm. And what would the network have been at that time? I I have no pigeons. idea. Yeah, p- definitely <laughs> the, the, the pigeon uh, pigeon AT and T. But but think about that twenty years from now while we're trying to conduct a longitudinal study on five G, and then like where the technology would be. It just Ben, you're so right, dude. It's impossible. It, there there's no way we can keep up with any of that. And by that time, it's we're already dosed and it's over. And the next thing comes along and we're getting dosed again. Yeah. It's a great point and it brings us to um, one uh, – an excellent FAQ from cancer.gov uh, talking about this wherein they they note that not only is technology evolving rapidly, not only is the number of cell phone users increasing rapidly, but over time, the number of cell phone calls per day, the length of each call, the amount of time people use phones in general has increased. And because of changes in the technology and increases in the number of base stations for transmitting these signals, the exposure from cell phone use, power output, has changed, mostly lowered in many regions of the United States. And what we what we see here is a a battle of perspectives. There are multiple variables that we have to include or consider and many of these variables change at what is a lightning pace, right? We do know that the WHO does consider cell phones to be a possible human carcinogen. Cell phones are listed in a in a grouping called Group 2B as possible human carcinogens. So is this a conspiracy theory? If so, the WHO agrees, but we have to add some important perspective here. Uh, There are other things on the list that might surprise you. Group 2B also contains aloe vera, possible human carcinogen. As in topical or ingestion? I don't know, man. YOLO, right? (laughs) Roll the dice. You ever have one of those uh, aloe vera drinks with the juice and then the little squishy bits of aloe? Yeah, I hate those. You don't like it? I think it's gross. It's like chewing on a gummy bear and drinking a refreshing drink at the same time. A squishy, squishy gummy bear. See, I can't do anything like tapioca balls. You don't like you don't like it? No. Those bubble teas. Boba. Great. You don't like the boba? No. For me the the thing with aloe vera I think is that when I used to go in the sun, uh, it would aloe vera would often be uh, something used to treat sunburns or yeah. aches from that. Very so, familiar. Yeah, so for a completely subjective uh, unpleasant 
mnemonic associations, it feels like I'm drinking sunburns when I drink it out of the <laughs> Just because I associate, you know, yeah. that smell and that kind of taste. Well, you've got some of the synesthesia going on too, so it was probably really close to that. It's, yeah. But you know what, man? More aloe vera for you, Noel. Yeah. If you're into those. Thanks, guys. <laughs> and my wife's family. And, Enjoy. And, all right. Aloe vera for everybody. So where does this leave us? If mobile phones did indeed cause cancer in a, in a huge amount, we could expect to see a few things, especially now that people have been using these for decades. We would expect to see a significant spike in brain cancer rates, right, following the massive increase in cell phone usage, and yet there has not been a change. Not that kind of change, at least, right? Yes, according to these studies, brain cancer is actually decreasing, or the the number of instances of brain cancer are decreasing. That's pretty great, right? And, um, I mean, I'm okay with that. I think the latest number I saw, I forget the exact dates it was from, but it was four and a half brain cancer cases for every 1,000 people in the United States under age 65. And that was, uh, okay, so that was from 2011 to 2015. And previously that number had been uh, 19.1 cases for every 100,000 people 65 or older. So decreasing uh, that um, brain cancer to that amount is pretty dang great. And that has nothing to do with cell phone usage, at least I don't think, mm. unless there's something magical we don't know about. But wouldn't we, wouldn't we reasonably expect this sort of cancer to accelerate? If right? it increases in rats in the way that, yeah. that one study showed? Yeah. It's that whole, are rats human beings question that we humans have been struggling with for so many I years. I feel like we answered that Nim. I <laughs> love the secret of Nim. Are you talking like like anthropomorphic human being, like in Ratatouille? Or secret <laughs> of Nim? Secret of Nim. Oh, God, that's great. Holds up. Yeah. That's so insane. Good. It's very sad. Fantastic. The book's good, too. Right. But what about five old guys? He's a mouse. What he, about five? Yeah, he's a mouse. Yeah, never mind. Never he, mind. He he went west in the uh, less lauded sequel. Give him the old lazy eye. <laughs> That's from Five Will Goes West. No way. Yeah, man, good memory, Ben. It's a it's it's a pivotal part of the plot. The old lazy eye. It is important. <laughs> it is it is important. <laughs> To someone. Uh, yeah, we see that areas that absorb radio waves have fewer tumors, not more. And luckily for everyone involved, the research continues today. Uh, the group responsible for this study is collaborating with other organizations to develop smaller exposure chambers for additional short-term studies that will take weeks or maybe months instead of two years. And these studies are meant to target in and clarify what NTP learned in their long-term studies and then, it was very forward-thinking, to investigate the possibility of DNA damage in exposed tissue. So get to some po – eventually, potentially, some epigenetic stuff. It's also being designed so studies of different RFR frequencies and modulations can finally adapt to the changing technologies in the telecom industry today. Will it work? That remains to be seen, but we do have to consider that while many of us may fret about cancer as the, as, as the imminent danger posed by cell phones, other people will tell us that cell phones pose dangers entirely unrelated to cancer and related instead to um, attention span or uh, related to uh, our neurochemistry. Yeah, or our privacy. Oh, yes, and that one. I feel like that's so well-known, right? Yeah. Have we found ourselves in a bubble, you guys? Or do we believe that certain things are normal that other people would think are uh, crack pottery? No, not at all. I don't think so. I think everybody at this point has had a conversation near their phone and then an ad was served to them, mm -hmm. you know, just coincidentally. And even if it is just everyone functioning on coincidence – yeah, even if it is Bader Meinhof, it's occurring in a massive scale. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Bader Meinhof is that thing we've mentioned it before. Bader Meinhof is a psychological thing where maybe you wake up and you have a song in your head. Why do you build me up, Buttercup, or whatever song is stuck in your head? And then later you hear it on the radio or out in the field, and you think, "Holy smokes, is the Matrix broken? 
Do I have precog abilities? Or, as Bader Meinhof would argue, do I just pay more attention to something like that because I'm looking for it? Like the first time you hear a specific word, you hear the word susurrus. You learn the word susurrus and then over the next week, suddenly everybody is saying the word susurrus to you. Uh, totally. In this instance that just occurred, my wife went to the dentist mm -hmm. and her hygienist recommended a certain type of whitening strips. And immediately after jumping on an app on her phone, there was an ad served for it. And I think it may be what you're talking about, Peter Meinhoff. But uh, anyway, very strange. Maybe. But here is a devil's advocacy exercise, Matt. She saw this on her phone. Yeah. She took her phone to the dentist. Yeah. With her, right? Yeah. Uh, so the phone has the capability to know her GPS. <laughs> it location. knows that she's at the dentist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ew, yeah, you're so right. Law enforcement solves crimes with GPS data. Yeah. And she hasn't turned off all that stuff. I'm just saying, if you really want to avoid these sorts of situations, <laughs> or no, I'm not telling people to commit crimes. But if you if you want to avoid being tracked like that, you can do uh, the old Breaking Bad trick. You can leave your cell phone somewhere else. You can tape it to uh, the underside of a friend's car. Uh, I have – OK. I'll say this on air. This is just between us and, and like just between the millions of us. A long time ago, a friend of mine, who I will not name, was a – it seemed to be, I thought he was a trust fund person, right? Because he didn't have a, any visible means of employment. But he traveled a lot domestically and internationally and he seemed to have adventures. And one day he told me that uh, he, he needed me to do a favor for him. And I thought, oh, am I watching a pet? Am I keeping an eye on a house or an apartment or something? And it was not that. The guy was going to be gone for two or three weeks, but he wanted me to keep his phone in my car and drive in a, the regular pattern in which I would have driven at the time. And keep it on? And keep it on. Hmm. Dude. Ben. Which establishes, right? Possibly an alibi. But yeah. he was he was also a very paranoid person, so – was he prescient or was he just sketchy or was he deluded or was it all a hilarious prank? I think it all depends on if it was a 3G network or an LTE or 5G. Like what are we talking <laughs> here? Like I think that's the most important thing. That guy gave me car cancer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, we, you know, we, we notice the neurochemistry stuff here. We notice the, the big data, the paranoia. Uh, it is true that in – Many applications, social media is one, um, online games are another. Um, many applications, the designers, the developers, the programmers are well aware of human psychology and they build these interactions to reward you and to engender what some would say is addictive behavior, right? You always get a little rush of a happy chemical in your brain when you say, oh, someone liked, retweeted, subscribed, the, so on, you know, and that stuff works. No one's invulnerable to it. We're virtually all human, I would say. Yeah. Most of us listening. I would hope ben, so. Ben did this thing with his, with his jawline just then. It was, it was handsome. It looked very nice, but it was, it was a little. Uh, chilling? Yeah. Well, think about it. There's going to be at some point. Uh, is a machine consciousness that will be able to listen to all of the podcasts ever made very quickly. So, and then host a conspiracy show. <laughs> Wouldn't oh, that be no. great? Oh, we could, uh, we could definitely do with a machine consciousness host. Would love to hear that perspective. Would love to hear their take on cancer and cell phones. Um, <laughs> what What do you think? There's There's another thing. This is the I, I don't know about you guys, but from my end, this is one of the last things. You hear a lot of people get a little curmudgeonly, right, and say, "Oh, people are always in their phones; they're not living in the moment," you know. Um, and that that is true. It gets a very unintentionally um, easy thing for people to do, which is you know, you're in a conversation 
or someone's in a conversation with you, but you're not there, you're on your phone. But I would challenge people to look back at photographs of public spaces in the age of newspapers. People weren't talking to each other then. They were on the train with a newspaper in front of their face. Mm, But what about before paper? What about the photographs before paper? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, if you have a photograph before the invention of paper, please send it to us. <laughs> uh, oh Lord! Yeah, what do you guys think though? Is there is there sand to this? What's 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 the word? Right now, my conclusion would be there's some disturbing stuff, and more studies need to be conducted. You know what I mean? I would concur. I and in you know, my opinion would be that Wi-Fi and cellular technology, radio signals in general, it's all part of artificial intelligence attempting to emerge and kill off all of the biological life with cancer. So there you go. <laughs> there you go. That is bleak, man. Enjoy it. Enjoy wow. it. Wow. What a way to go. We got, Seriously. We, what? We got a couple more decades left. Maybe one. Are you one of those people who's more comforted by the idea that a plan exists, even if it's nefarious, rather than our earlier assertion that humanity is just one long improv sketch? Definitely. I don't know. What do you think, Noel? Ooh. Phone cancer. Yeah, like what? For it or against it? <laughs> <laughs> what do you what do you think? What do you think? Uh, I mean, it's it sure seems like it's a lot like rat saccharin. <laughs> you know what uh, I mean? Yes. I don't know. It just seems like again, like we were saying, there are things since we since it's a little bit inconclusive right now and we know that we're being bombarded with all kinds of stuff. It is one thing that we do have a direct ability to kind of limit if we choose to do so. So I would say if you're worried about it, maybe use it as an excuse to stay off your device a little bit. You know, I don't know. That's that's the best advice I can offer. I'm certainly not following that advice that I'm giving myself. Mm-hmm. And it's a good excuse to have a little more interaction outside the screen like you were talking about, Ben. Mm-hmm. If you – let's use it. Let's use it. It's sort of like Let's the use floor. The fear. Is, it's like the floor is lava. The floor is yes. lava. Cell phones give you cancer. Yeah. Okay. And okay. and take all all your personal information at the same time to sell you tooth whitening strips. That's so if we can propagate mm-hmm. a perhaps false conspiracy that cell phones do give us cancer, we can solve a lot of problems. You want to bernaze this? Is that what you're saying? We can, you want, you want somebody to... out there can bernaze this. That's right. What I'm Someone can. Yes. Yes. And I can't encourage you to do that. Mm-mm, not officially. We cannot officially <laughs> say that this would be a very interesting experience and experiment. We cannot, mm. again, officially say that it would be a rollicking good time and fascinating. And also, please don't do that. We're 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 being we're joking around here. Matt is definitely joking. <laughs> See <laughs> your jocularity. Uh, yes, I. I don't know. I. Th- I think it's interesting. I want to hear more. I want to update this and, and follow along with the subsequent studies. And we'd like we'd like to hear from you because one thing's for sure, regardless of how people feel about this, most people are still using cell phones, just like you said, Noel, and. This means that the, these things probably aren't going to go away for some time, right? So let us know. Cell phones, cancer, connection, alarmism, cover-up. You can find us on Instagram. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Facebook. You can meet the best part of this show, your fellow listeners, on our community page. Here's where it gets crazy, which the um, the memes on there are getting pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever go on? You, do you check in on that? I do. Yeah. I, I go to ours and I go to the ridiculous history one no, as well. You don't. Yes, I do. You sweet man, you. I like it. When are when are we going to be able to cajole you into? Oh, we can't even say yet. We we shouldn't huh? say yet. Huh? About any possible cameos. We just don't want to make any promises so people don't get let down. That's right, Omerta. Yeah. Don't tell anybody uh, that the old genie is going to. Pop out of the bottle over there on ridiculous history. We don't, Wait, we don't do that anymore. What happened? What <laughs> happened? Southern, what happened to Matt Frederick? It's my Southern gentleman Who, uh, genie. Who's I this? Grant big? you one wish, and that wish is of my choosing. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> Who is this big old sassafras? Shouldn't have rubbed that bottle. That's what my mommy always said, and your pappy should have said it too. Don't rub that bottle <laughs> or the genie might pop out. <laughs> yes, yes. You heard it here first, folks. And then uh, he will forcefully give you one wish that you do not like. <laughs> of his choosing. This is so sinister. Okay, we have we have to go. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, we're going to go hunt down Matt, uh, maybe with the help of this somewhat uh, sinister, but, you know, overall very endearing Southern gentleman. And that's the end of this classic episode. If you have any thoughts or questions about this episode, you can get into contact with us in a number of different ways. One of the best is to give us a call. Our number is one eight three three S T D W Y T K. If you don't want to do that, you can send us a good old fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.